Hey everyone, I hope you're having a great day in the Lord. and Welcome to another edition of the Shepherd's Herald, and I am your Shepherd's Herald, Pastor Eric Clemmy from Lamb of God Lutheran Church, coming at you on this beautiful day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today, once again, we're going to be taking a look at the Holy Gospel for this coming Sunday, which is Mark at the 10th chapter. And so Pharisees came up in order to test Jesus, and they asked him, <clears throat> Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Well, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, It was because of the hardness of your heart that he wrote you this commandment. But from the very beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but now are one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let man not separate. Now in the house, his disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And then they were bringing little children to him that he might touch them. And Jesus' disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. And he said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. For truly, truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and he blessed them laying his hands upon them. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So what do we have going on here? Let's unpack this now, shall we? And take a look and see what the Lord is communicating to us through his inspired word today. So the last several weeks, we've been looking at Jesus teaching his disciples and, and trying to strengthen their faith. And their, and their faith was ebbing and flowing and they weren't getting the message. And then one moment they get it and another moment they slip back with hard hearts or into unbelief. And he's been bolstering them up and their faith. And now, while he is with his disciples, the Pharisees are coming up to him and they're asking him a question here. And this is a hostile question to test him. They asked him it, whether it was lawful for a man to divorce his wife. Well, why did they ask him this? First of all, we must take a look and see where this is taking place. This is taking place in the region where Herod Antipas was the Tetrarch. He was ruling in this area. And what do we know about Herod? We know that this is the same Herod Antipas that crossed paths with John the Baptist. And John the Baptist called Herodias, which was the new wife of Herod, called them out on the carpet for committing adultery. Herodias was... Herod's brother's Philip's wife. He was committing adultery with his sister-in-law, essentially. And Herod called them out on this. And this is what ultimately cost, or I should say, John called Herod out on this. And this is what ultimately cost John the Baptist his head. He really ticked off Herodias. The hell hath no fury as a woman scorned. And here is a woman who was scorned by John the Baptist, told she was a sinner, told she needed to repent, said that she was an adulterous whore, committing adultery against her husband Philip with, with Herod Antipas here. And remember, Herod kind of tolerated John. He feared God, but he feared his own reputation and looking bad even more. And we know all about the dancing girl and the head of the John the Baptist coming forth on a, on a platter. Well, the Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus in the same thing that got John into trouble. Is it lawful then for a man to divorce his wife? Well, 
what did Moses command you? Well, he allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Well, that's because your hearts were hard. And this is not really the will of God from the very beginning, because it says from the beginning of creation, God made the male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but now they are one. And what God has joined together, let man not separate. So he's affirming and reaffirming and confirming the condemnation that John brought down upon Herod and Herodias. This is not the will of God. The reason that Moses wrote you this commandment, he said, is because you were stubborn, obstinate, hard-hearted people, and you just did not get it. It was not the will of God from the very, very beginning. This was something that you guys brought upon yourselves throughout your hardness, your hardness of hearts. So they were trying to trap Jesus here. They were trying to get him in trouble the same way John got in trouble and ultimately lost his head. But divorce was an accommodation, you see, to human weakness, but it was never God's intent from the very beginning. It was a way to bring order into the society that had disregarded God's will, but it was not the standard that God wanted for his people. He talks about the sanctity of marriage here, that it's holy, it's set apart from, it's a sanctified union. It is Two people coming together as one flesh. Well, what does that mean? What does this one flesh relationship really mean? Well, let's go back to Genesis, to the creation of Adam and Eve to begin with. He said, let us make man in our image. In our image, let us create them male and female. So what does this mean being made in the image of God? Well, it doesn't mean that we physically look like God. God is ultimately spirits. So what what is this male and female? Well, God possesses all the attributes of masculinity and femininity in one being, one person. In our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all of the attributes of both men and women are fully present. Now, we're created in the image of God. That means that we reflect this truth and this reality in our nature and how he he intended us to be before sin mixed up the whole works. He intended that a man and a woman will come together through the sexual act, the one flesh act, and they will become one being, reflecting the oneness that is in God himself and the fullness of God's image, possessing all the attributes of both men and women. When he he created for Adam a helper, a helpmate, somebody who is going to complete him, Sometimes we hear when a, a beloved spouse dies, of a, you know, the, the people have been married 40, 50, 60, 70 years or whatever in some cases, and they say, I lost my better half. Or they might say about their spouse while they're living that she's my better half or he's my better half. They're not off base here. Together, In the sanctity of marriage and what God has joined together, we are truly one. All the attributes of masculinity and femininity are present in that one flesh relationship. Our brains are wired different by God and for a reason. When we come together and we work together, we balance each other out. 
and we start to love and appreciate each other on such a deep and profound level. That was God's intention from the very beginning. Now, the public wedding ceremony is essentially a hands-off declaration of what God has joined together. Let no one separate, tear asunder, adulterate. This is a hands-off declaration to the people of the community that I am committed to that woman, that woman is committed to me, and now we are one, and we belong together. It's no hanky-panky, no temptations, no fooling around what God has joined together in this one flesh relationship. Let no one separate or come between or tear asunder. But human hearts are hard, and after the fall into sin, the result of the fact that we are living in a sinful creation and we sin in thought, word, deed, by what we do and by what we don't do, relationships are taxed, they're strained. Today we call it irreconcilable differences or whatever the case might be. And people wind up getting a divorce. And the purpose of a divorce was never meant to be a one-time divorce. I'm never going to have anything more to do with you ever again. I'm writing my hands, wringing my hands, washing my hands of you, getting rid of you, and that's it, moving on. The same purpose that there is in church discipline, as we see in Matthew 18, is to win the brother or the sister over. It's to keep the door to reconciliation open, to continue to have contact with one another. It was meant really as a temporary separation so that ultimately reconciliation will be able to take place and the two shall become one again. That possibility should always be kept open in the divorce. However, as the disciples were questioning Jesus about this, he says to them in better detail, whoever divorces his wife and marries another and closes that door to reconciliation commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she closes the door and she is the one who commits adultery. This is serious stuff that, that Jesus is talking about here. The structure of the family and this one flesh relationship. And I know from my own personal experience, I've been down this path. I never thought that I would live to be a statistic, especially given you know what, what I do for a living. But my wife, my first wife, divorced me. She left me. Couldn't stand to be around me anymore. Didn't want to be a pastor's wife. Didn't want that life, that life in the fishbowl. And she even admitted she did not have a biblical reason for the divorce. There was no infidelity or abuse or neglect or anything like that on anybody's part. She just wanted it. And so she got it. I tried to make her promise to keep that door for reconciliation open, but I, you know, I know she didn't, wasn't having any of that. I know that also she ultimately was excommunicated from the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod because she divorced her husband without a biblical reason. I know she went on and married another person, which freed me up to go ahead and marry another person by the grace of God. The Lord indeed provided a suitable helper for me and Jennifer, and I don't know where I would be today without my better half, but it only happened after that door to reconciliation was slammed shut. And the reason that I'm a pastor today is because the onus of the responsibility fell on my ex and what she did, how she did it, and her getting married or remarried and breaking that one flesh relationship.
Now, it sounds harsh. I mean, these things happen every day. It's very common in our society. There are people that will ask, why even bother getting married to begin with? Why bother with it? So much easier just to live with one another and, and, and cohabitate and all that kind of stuff. And why do you want to mix up your finances and, and get into these legal battles? And it always winds up in divorce. And what a messy thing a divorce is. Then you have the kids and the kids are collateral damage and all of this kind of stuff. So why even bother getting married to begin with? Because it was the will of God for us from the very beginning, even before the fall into sin. He has created us the way he has to reflect the fullness of the unity of his nature, of his image, as we join in that one flesh relationship together. And what happens when that one flesh relationship is divided? Time and time and time again could lead to jaded views about the opposite sex, jaded views about marriage and family and relationship. And we see that more and more in younger folks now these days. But the marriage covenant was always intended by God to be sanctified, sanctity set apart from a one flesh relationship that God has joined together. We get married because we want to reflect the full image of God as best we can. And because of sin, we, we don't know God's mind. We can't see God. We don't reflect the full glory and love, the agape love of God. Sin blocks all of that. It adulterated that. It adulterated it. And there was nothing that we could do to set it right. And that is why Jesus Christ had to come and put on our human flesh and to suffer and die for all of us so that we may be justly and rightly justified by grace through faith in his own death and his own resurrection. It's in his death and resurrection that we are redeemed, that we are justified, that we are saved. It is not in our own works. It is not in our own boasting works. It is not in our own reason, choice, or decision, or our own will. Our will is bound in sin and death and Satan, and there is absolutely nothing that we could do to set ourselves free. But Jesus Christ comes down and meets us in our level, and he saves us, and he raises us up, and, and he wants us now as his disciples to live to a higher standard. We don't just live down to the result of the curse uh, of the sin, of the fall and the sin, but from the very beginning, he intended us to have this one flesh marriage relationship for Adam, for Eve, for all of us. And ultimately, in most cases, God willing to be fruitful and to multiply, which leads us right into the next portion of our gospel lesson here. Children are the result, the natural result of that one flesh relationship, isn't it? The two come together physically, emotionally, and spiritually in a one flesh relationship. And children are the happy consequence of that one flesh relationship, the way God originally intended to be fruitful and to multiply. And what do we see here having going on here? The little children, the little children now are coming to Jesus to be blessed by him. Now, this is the third occasion in two chapters where Jesus illustrates the faith of little children. The first time he was talking about who is the greatest. And he, he said, whoever receives one of these little ones, he takes the child in his arms and he holds them. Whoever receives one of these little ones receives me. And not only me, but the one who sent me, the father. Last week, we also heard about having the faith of a child. And today, again, a faith of a child and anyone who even leads one of these little ones astray or to sin against, you know, that, that believes in me to sin, it'd be better for a big millstone to be tied around his neck and thrown into the depths of the sea. And today, we have him saying that the childlike faith is what's really important, what really matters. A child is receptive. 
He is receptive to love, to gifts lavished upon them. And he does not want children to be hindered. You know, children were kind of seen, especially back in Jesus' day and up until recent decades, sort of, kind of, as second-class citizens. They did not have a say. They did not have a vote. They had no rights within the even the family structure. In Roman society, children were put in, uh, their charges were slaves. Slaves looked after the children. They were the magisters or the magistras, the teachers that, that taught the children, especially Greek teachers and Greek slaves. They had no rights until the father of the house said that they were ready to enter into adulthood. And usually that happened around 14 or so years of age. Up until that time, a child wore a child's gown, had a little amulet around their neck with a little god head of protection around them. But once the father declared that it was time to become a man, for example, they would put off their child garb and put on their manly gown, the toga. They would get rid of the little thing of protection who didn't need it anymore. And now they were men and they had rights and they could vote. But Jesus is saying that even the little helpless children, the ones who can't speak for themselves, the ones who apparently have no rights, these, this is the faith, the receptiveness of a child. This is what the father likes. This is what he wants. And don't hinder a child. Don't let them think they're nuisances, especially in church or around me, Jesus is saying here. But let them come to me. And he takes them up again in his arms. Like This is the third time, like I said, that he's used children as an example in teaching within one or two chapters. And he takes these children up and he blesses them. He lays their hand, his hands upon them. He lets them know that he is taking care of them. He loves them. And he says, truly, who does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter into it. A child receives a free gift, doesn't question it, doesn't work for it, doesn't earn it. It's given to them and they receive it joyfully. A little child's faith, that's what he's called to, us to have. Not to be childlike, childish, immature, but to be weaned from the spiritual milk of the faith, to sink our teeth into the meat of the faith, but all the while to still have a childlike faith, not a childish faith, but a childlike faith that is open to the receptivity of the free gifts and grace that God bestows on us, especially through his blessed son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we have the sanctity of marriage and that what God has joined together, let not anyone, man, woman, or anybody else come in between and separate and we have the receptiveness of children, and children being the offspring, the fruits of this one flesh relationship, and that it's important to just be receptive and to receive the grace of that God has freely given us. We don't earn it. Again, I can't stress this enough. We don't earn it. We don't work for it. We don't accept it. The Holy Spirit working through the word of God for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God comes into our hearts, come to, to our mind through these effective means of grace of word and sacrament. And he instills saving faith in our minds and in our hearts. He enlightens us. He loosens our lips so that we could declare forth the praise of God in Jesus Christ, that we could confess Jesus Christ as Lord, for no one can confess Jesus Christ as Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit, as Paul says. 
It is only through that effective Holy Spirit that comes in and, 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 and gives us, enables us to confess Jesus Christ and to have a right relationship with one another. These are the fruits of faith. This is the result of the fact that God loves us. He has justified us. He has saved us by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And that he is strengthening us and nourishing us, and we we respond to his great love by wanting to hold the sanctity of the marriage covenants sacred. About loving our children and bringing them to church, letting them cry, I remember in the old King James, I think Jesus said, uh, suffer the little children to come unto me and hinder them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. I like that suffer thing because I, re- I remember way back in, in, I think it was in my first congregation, it was close to 30 years ago, children would cry. Old people would complain that children were crying can't hear the pastor, can't understand, got to shut that kid up, take him out. Why doesn't he take him out to the parking lot? Get rid of that kid, he's loud. Give him a good spanking. Ah, Teach him to sit in that pew. Whatever the case might be. I've heard it, I've seen it, it's been there. And one time I was remembered during my sermon, there was there was some children that were crying and screaming out there, and and some of the parents started to you know to shush them up, and I was like, no, no, Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me, and they're coming to suffering. It's okay. I love to hear the voices of children in worship, crying, laughing, giggling, speaking, whatever the case is. They are not to be hindered. They're not to be seen as a burden. They're not to be seen as second-class citizens or unworthy of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is to them, and as well as it is to all of us, that this message is given. We marry, and the reason we marry is to continue to love as God has loved us, to reflect the image of God as we are in one flesh together, as male and female, as God is one together, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit reflecting the fullness of his image. And we, one day we shall see face to face. One day we shall know fully as we are already fully known. But until then, we struggle and we strive. We strive to love and to serve as he has loved and served us. For each and every single one of us are children of our Heavenly Father. He is the shepherd of tender youth. He shepherds us. No matter how mature we may think we are, we are, especially on a spiritual level, very immature. We see as but a blurred image in the mirror. We don't understand rightly. We don't see rightly. Only in heaven will we see and know fully and understand. Until then, love guides us. The love of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, working through the effective means of grace, sustaining us, nourishing us, equipping us for every good work, shielding us behind the mighty fortress of our God, putting on the full armor of God, clothing ourselves with these means of grace so that we could keep our eyes focused on Jesus Christ, the author, the perfecter, the pioneer of our faith, and that we may grow in our, in our marriage relationships, in love for one another, in constantly discovering one another and loving one another and having children that are not hindered but freely come to Jesus so that he blesses them as he blesses you and me and all people because we truly belong to him. He has claimed us. He has called us by name. We belong to him and nothing can separate us from that love. Amen.
And now today I'm gonna to take a look at, I alluded to it just a moment ago, uh, it's number 864, Shepherd of Tender Youth. Um, if you have your Lutheran service books available, please open up to hymn number 864 in the LSB and follow along with the words that we have here as I play the melody, ponder upon these words, ponder upon this gospel, ponder upon uh, God's grace for us this day. So let's take a look at this here now, Shepherd of Tender Youth. receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look with favor upon you and grant you his everlasting peace. Amen. Now let us depart in peace to love and serve the Lord as we love and serve all people as he has loved and served us. And let us always remember to keep the sanctity of the marriage covenants and to let the little children to come for as such belongs the kingdom of heaven as simple receptivity of a child. Amen.